Okay, so thank you for the introduction and let me thank once again the organizers uh, for giving us the opportunity to be here in this uh, wonderful location and uh, uh, for me to present uh, some uh, results about the frequency dependence of the vertex uh, of the fermionic uh, one particle irreducible two particle vertex uh, with uh, keeping an eye in particular on the functional renormalization group, uh, extension of the functional renormalization group, uh, and uh, yeah, how to include it uh, uh, in a more consistent way into the FRG. So uh, let me give first, an, does this work? Yeah. Let me first outline my talk, uh, which is essentially con uh, consisting of two parts. In the first part, uh, I, will discuss the, uh, I will really discuss the vertex frequency dependence, uh, uh, giving first some uh, definitions uh, of the one particle irreducible and the two particle irreducible vertexes. Uh, uh, then I will uh, uh, give a diagrammatic understanding of the vertex structure that arises uh, in frequency, and I will show how to decompose the vertex uh, and uh, how to use the information that comes from this uh, decomposition to reconstruct the vertex uh, in, a, in an efficient way for numerical calculation. The second part of the talk instead will be uh, showing uh, an application, I will introduce uh, the appli in a, an application, uh, namely the combination of dynamical mean field theory and functional renormalization group uh, that will be then discussed uh, in, the, in the next talk. And for this application, uh, it will be essential to consider the frequency dependence of the vertex. So let's start from something very basic. We know that uh, if we uh, consider the uh, two particle Green's function, it doesn't factorize as the product of the one particle Green's function because we have interaction between the electrons. And uh, these interactions are described by the one particle irreducible vertex, which is uh, in some sense the equivalent of, the, uh, of what the self energy is at one particle level. What I want to stress now is that, is that in functional renormalization group, people have acquired over the years uh, a, uh, a big deal of experiences for understanding uh, the momentum dependence of the vertex. So we are getting familiar with this kind of plot in which uh, we mainly consider the, uh, the momentum dependence. And uh, we can understand this plot, so we can understand what, is the, what are the leading instabilities if we look at the location of the, uh, of the structures in the momentum, and we can compute the susceptibilities. But uh, there is something which in a, a conventional functional renormalization group has been always uh, uh, neglected, namely the, uh, namely the frequency dependence of the vertex, which, uh, uh, which I want to address uh, in, uh, in this talk. So, uh, in my experience, it's always uh, a bit confusing uh, uh, when uh, we talk about the vertex, uh, uh, the notation. So I want to just fix a notation. We have an object which depends on, uh, in principle on four arguments, but uh, one can be fixed by uh, frequency and momentum conservation, and so we are left with, uh, we are left with uh, three arguments, and uh, we are free to choose these arguments in the way that is most convenient uh, for, our, for our goals. So I will uh, choose always uh, to... Uh, show a vertex which depends on two fermionic arguments, uh, to, on uh, two fermionics four vectors, so which are the arguments of the incoming and, outgo and outgoing uh, uh, lines. And uh, uh, the third argument will be rather a bosonic four vector, which is a, a momentum transfer, is a combination of the, of the arguments appearing uh, uh, at, uh, at the outgoing and incoming arrows, and uh, which combination depends on which channel we are considering. So, for example, if we consider the particle-particle channel, it will be appropriate to describe or to show the vertex uh, in terms uh, of the total incoming uh, or outgoing uh, uh, frequency or momentum. Now, since I want to focus uh, on the uh, frequency dependence of the uh, of the vertex, uh, I will uh, uh, show results that are obtained for a model which only has frequency, which doesn't have any momentum dependence, namely the single impurity Anderson model in the wide band limit. And I will show results that are obtained uh, by means of functional renormalization group. So here I show a first plot of the vertex. And just for you to get familiar with this kind of object, so what we plot here is plotted at a fixed uh, bosonic frequency, while the two fermionic frequencies here are left to change. What we can see is that this object, uh, from the color coding, we can see that this object is not flat, but uh, it shows uh, some uh, diagonal structure which uh, do not decay 
uh, when the frequency is increased. So they already suggest that uh, there is a large frequency behavior that uh, uh, we need to take into account uh, in our calculation. So uh, how to understand better this, uh, uh, the origin of this structure? Well, the first thing that we can do is decompose the vertex uh, by using uh, some uh, uh, diagrammatic classification, and it is well known that the vertex can be decomposed by means of the parquet equation, and the F vertex is the one particle irreducible vertex, contains a collection of all the diagrams that do not fall apart by cutting one fermionic lines. It can be shown then that all these diagrams can be classified being either two particle irreducible or two particle reducible in only one channel. So what does it mean two particle irreducible? It means that uh, uh, these diagrams uh, uh, do not uh, uh, fall apart by cutting two fermionic lines. In this context, let me stress that uh, these are the diagrams, uh, these diagrams uh, cannot be computed by means of a functional randomization group at the one loop truncation level, so they are not part of our FRG calculation, and so this plot uh, has been computed uh, uh, by means of exact diagonalization, and uh, uh, the lowest order of this diagram is the fourth order, so they are subleading when at, uh, at weak coupling, and also they, they show a decay in frequency, so they don't have this uh, uh, large frequency behavior. Next, we can focus uh, on the uh, two-particle reducible, which classify as, a particle reducible, uh, as two particle reducible in the particle-particle channel, or in the particle all or uh, particle whole cross channels. So these diagrams can be instead computed in functional randomization group uh, simply by integrating each of the, uh, of the terms uh, in the uh, FRG differential equations uh, uh, in a separate way. And uh, uh, if we look at this, uh, this object, uh, they, look, uh, they look like this, uh, if we have a color plot. Uh, no, I don't specify here if it is a particle-particle, particle-all, or particle-all crossed uh, vertex, uh, since uh, uh, the consideration that I'm going to make are rather general. They are not specific to a given channel, but uh, uh, apply to all of them. And uh, in particular, we want to understand what is the uh, meaning or if there is uh, some uh, physical uh, uh, meaning into this uh, structure that we see in, uh, in the, into this uh, cross structure. So the next thing that we have to do is... Uh, uh, So to do this, uh, we need to rely on a further, uh, on a further assumption, uh, namely we will assume, as is uh, usual for the Hubbard-like models, uh, that, the action, that uh, the Bayer interaction is uh, lo local in frequency and time, which uh, uh, will impose some constraints on the, uh, uh, which imposes some constraints of the diagrams. In fact, we can see that uh, whenever we have a diagram in which two of the lines uh, uh, two external lines are attached uh, to the same bare vertex, uh, the fermionic argument does not enter into this bubble or into these lines, uh, which will only depend uh, on the uh, bosonic uh, transfer in the given uh, channel that we are considering. So this bubble here, for example, will not depend on any of the fermionic arguments, k prime and k, but will depend only on the bosonic transfer in the particle-particle channel. This is a consideration which is... Uh, uh, quite well known, uh, and uh, a tweak coupling is already, uh, has already been used uh, several times, uh, for example, for making uh, a, a weak coupling decomposition uh, uh, in the frequency or into the, into the momenta, or even for inhomogeneous system. This is quite well known, but what we want to do is uh, generalize this decomposition, uh, if possible, uh, to higher order. Well, we can use this consideration about the dependency of the, of the diagrams uh, to, uh, to divide further the phi functions uh, into uh, three classes of function, kernel 1, k2, uh, k2 bar, and rest. And uh, the first class, k1, is characterized by the fact that uh, all the external lines are attached to the same bare fermionic vertex, bare interaction vertex. The implication of this uh, is that uh, this diagram here will not depend on the fermionic uh, argument, uh, but will depend only on the bosonic argument. And so we have uh, an object which, uh, uh, this K1 object will depend only on the bosonic argument. And what we can see by the looking at uh, the diagrammatic structure is that uh, it includes exactly the same diagrams that we have included or that we have to include when we want, when we want to compute 
a physical susceptibility. So if we look at our plots now, we see that since the plots are at fixed omega and the, K, and the K1 does not depend on omega, this K1 appears here only into the background of this phi function. And if we make a, a scan of the phi function, we will see that, uh, uh, that the K1 object is rather uh, sharp and centered at zero frequency as it is consistent also with the susceptibility. Also, let me notice that if we look at the full vertex instead, we are plotting here again at one fixed bosonic uh, transfer, which means that the other two bosonic transfer are left free as we, change, uh, as we change the frequency here and here. And this line here exactly corresponds to this structure since it, is, uh, uh, since it corresponds to the line where omega 1 and omega 1 prime are uh, equal and opposite, so they are uh, so they exactly correspond to a total incoming momentum of zero that we can see here into the, into the plot of the K1. The next class of diagrams uh, is, uh, consists of diagrams of the class K2 in which uh, two of the uh, outgoing lines uh, or of the external lines are attached to their own vertex uh, while uh, the other two lines are attached to the same vertex. Also in this case we will have a simplification of the frequency dependence of this object which will turn out to depend only on uh, one fermionic and one bosonic argument. If you look at the plot, at the color plot, we can see that uh, we can obtain this, uh, uh, the structure of this K2 by making a scan at fixed omega frequency and keeping also the other frequency uh, at fixed transfer frequency and keeping fixed also the other fermionic frequency. And we will have the, uh, a structure like this for our K2 as a function of the, of the bosonic transfer, uh, transfer frequency. Now, uh, another thing that I want to notice about this is that this object also has a physical interpretation or can be connected to the fermion boson vertex as can be seen by uh, considering the, the diagrams that contribute to the class K2. Finally, there is the rest function, and for the rest function, each of the external lines is attached to its own bare vertex, which, uh, uh, and therefore, the frequency dependence, does, uh, dependence of this object does not simplify in any way, but rather we have to consider a full frequency dependence on, on, uh, uh, on all the arguments. Let me notice that uh, uh, this is a subleading at weak coupling, since it is at least fourth order in the interaction, and uh, this is the, uh, the only object for which we really need the full frequency dependence, and therefore is the, uh, numerically is the most expensive object to compute, but it's also the most localized ones, because it doesn't have any term which, uh, uh, which extends at high frequency, so we can compute it on a relatively small box, and uh, the size of the, of the box on which we need to compute it will depend on the strength of the interaction. It's also too important, important to notice that uh, uh, the same consideration that apply for the frequency also apply for the momentum, and uh, uh, the rest function is the one that is uh, relevant or will contain uh, the D-wave scattering, since in the D-wave scattering, for example, we will have a dependence on all the arguments, and so it doesn't simplify as the, uh, as the previous cases. So now that we have understood the physical meaning and uh, uh, classification of the structures that appears in the vertex, we want to use this information for our calculation, and in particular for FRG. So we can suppose to compute our phi functions in a finite box, and this can be computed either by inverting the beta salpeter equation if we have a method that, that gives us the one particle irreducible vertex, or it, they can be computed directly by uh, FRG integrating uh, each of the channel in a separate fashion. And uh, once, we have the, once we have computed these five functions, we can, uh, uh, we can use them to extend uh, the, the phi whenever we need to compute the vertex outside of this finite box. So for example, it is important that we consider also the high uh, frequency asymptotics of the vertex when we, uh, when we are looking for the vertex on the right hand side here in the FRG flow equation. And therefore, we want to extend the size of the, of, the, of the computed box. So we first extract the function k1, the background, and we extend it. We uh, do the same for the function k2 and k2 bar. And we have also this uh, uh, 
uh, this, uh, this structure at a high frequency. And the last step is extracting the function r just to check that uh, it is already decayed when we, uh, when we are at uh, the border of the boxes and we don't need to, uh, because if it is not decayed, we might need to increase the size of our calculation. So with this, I would like to conclude the first part of my talk. Uh, and uh, I've shown you that uh, uh, the, interaction vert uh, the, the interaction vertex shows a non-trivial non frequency structure, which, my, which we might need to include in our calculation. And uh, this vertex structure oh, sorry, can be understood uh, uh, diagrammatically. And uh, by, knowing, uh, uh, by knowing these uh, uh, asymptotics of the vertex, we can reduce our computational effort uh, uh, for function renormalization group. In the second part of the talk, instead, I will discuss the DMS square RG, a method in which we want to combine dynamical mean field theory uh, and functional renormalization group. And uh, for this method, the, the frequency dependence of the vertex is essential. That's my reason for uh, showing now the method that, that will be then discussed further in the next talk. I hope I have time. And, uh, Yes, so what is the goal? The goal is to combine the non-perturbative local, uh, non local physics uh, that comes from the MFT with the non-local fluctuations that we can include by means of the functional renormalization group. So how does it work? Uh, one can show that in infinite dimensions, or in the infinite dimensional limit, uh, uh, the self-energy of the lattice, uh, the self-energy of an infinite dimensional lattice, becomes exactly local. Uh, and if we have a self-energy which, uh, uh, which is local, this can uh, uh, allow us for an exact mapping on an Anderson impurity model, which we have to embed in a self-consistent uh, frequency-dependent buff. So what we will have is a buff that will be uh, mean field in space, but uh, due to its frequency dependence, it will, not be, it will go beyond uh, mean field in, uh, in time. So we will still have uh, local fluctuations. Then the next step, after we have mapped uh, the, uh, the infinite lattice to the, onto the uh, Anderson impurity model, we can solve exactly the Anderson impurity model. And by now, there are several techniques that allow us to do that numerically, like quantum Monte Carlo exact diagonalization. And then we will, uh, we will take this, uh, uh, this Anderson impurity model, this DMFT solution of the, of the infinite dimensional lattice, as a starting point for the FRG flow equation. So conceptually, we will start from, uh, uh, we want to solve a lattice problem. We will approximate this lattice problem with an infinite dimensional lattice, uh, which has the same density of states. We will map the infinite dimensional lattice on a, on a self-consistent uh, impurity model. And then uh, after solving this impurity model, we will flow to the original lattice. So we can see this as uh, uh, approximated the, the, our lattice with an infinite dimensional one, and then uh, flowing away, uh, removing uh, by means of the flow all the extra dimension that we have added for, for giving an approximate solution. Another way to see this uh, is that instead of starting from an initial action that does not contain any, um, uh, any interaction or any correlation, we start from an initial action which already contains a lot of correlation, which already contains the local correlation. And this is the initial action of the DMFT. So for the functional randomization group to be possible, we require, we need that the interaction part in the two actions, in the initial and in the final action, is the same, while we can only act on the uh, Gaussian propagator. What we have is that uh, the action of DMFT uh, has uh, the vice field uh, as a Gaussian propagator. And this vice field is, uh, at, uh, is uh, an important object in, the, in uh, DMFT because it, uh, uh, it has all the information about, uh, uh, about the uh, density of states of the original lattice. So the vice field uh, is the solution of this self-consistency equation, which is the equation that tells us that uh, the impurity problem has the same green function of the lattice once we have computed the green function of the lattice, approximating the self-energy with the local self-energy of the impurity problem. And we want to flow from this action to the full action of the lattice, so we have to recover in the end of the flow the, um, the Gaussian propagator of the lattice we are interested in, 
And for doing this, we just need to define a flow that uh, allows us to go from this propagator to this propagator. And the simplest choice is just an interpolation between, uh, uh, between, the, two, uh, between the two propagators. Uh, but uh, let me also notice here that this is not at all the most general choice, which instead can be done by including some regulating functions from which we only require that uh, 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 from which we only require some condition at uh, the initial uh, stage and at the final stage. So for lambda initial and for lambda final. The last thing that uh, uh, we need to change uh, compared to the usual FRG are the initial conditions, uh, which already include the correlation of the MFT, uh, which means they already include the, self, uh, the uh, dynamical mean field theory self-energy and the dynamical mean field theory vertex, uh, which is strongly frequency dependent. And uh, for the effect of the frequency dependence uh, uh, of the, uh, for the effect of the inclusion of the MFT into F FRG, I will, uh, um, I will uh, leave the uh, word to the next speaker and uh, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. <laughs>